Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for volunteering. Uh, I was trying to cheer as many of you as possible. Um, and, and kudos to those that volunteered and you don't really know what you're doing, <laughs> right? Um, but it's okay, this is just gonna be something really fun. Um, so um, I am the director at UCR School of Medicine for case-based learning. Um, I I'm accompanied today by two of my amazing MS1s, uh, Maddie and Carolyn. Um, and they're going to um, actually lead you through this exercise and give you just a glimpse of what it's like to be uh, a medical student here at UCR. Um, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, and then Maddie, can you give me a thumbs up if it's on our first slide? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm gonna pass this off to, um, to Maddie. All right, hi everyone. And again, thank you to everyone who volunteered um, and everyone who will volunteer through the chat function. I'm just gonna give a quick overview of what our case-based learning is um, or the CBL sessions. So this is actually something that we do as medical students almost every Friday. So we go in and it's a two hour session where they introduce a patient case. And we really go through the whole patient case from their presentation to the clinic, to what kind of history we might, we might wanna take, what kind of imaging we might wanna do, all the way through to the diagnosis of the patient. Um, so it's a really fun way to integrate what we're learning in the classroom and be able to apply it to an actual patient um, encounter. Um, but it's also really fun because you just, it's very casual and it's a way to just participate and really learn that clinical judgment so for those of you who did decide to um, come up as panelists, it's really relaxed, like don't worry, it's not about getting the right answer, it's just about contributing and like, trying a new thing. Um, so really casual environment just to learn how to think like a clinician. If you want to go to the next slide, we'll have Carolyn introduce the idea of learning issues. Hi everyone, again, thank you so much for volunteering to participate in our CDL session. And so like Maddie said, this is something that we do every single week where we're presented a case and we um, kind of collaborate on what we think we should do. And one of the big things that all of us medical students have to do is um, our learning issues. And what learning issues are, are they're basically topics related to the case that we're learning. And so it's our way to kind of dive into a specific topic even more on our own time. It usually takes around 20 minutes to an hour, depending on how in depth you want to go into the issue. And then afterwards, the next week, we present it to the rest of our classmates and kind of teach each other what we learned that week. And so it's a very again, like casual, relaxed way to just tell each other what we learned. And for this CBL, we're, we have a couple of learning issues that if on your own time, you can just go ahead and Google it while we're talking, or, but we are gonna go into every single one of these um, during this entire uh, session. So don't worry about it. It's just a short Google search or you can go um, research more in depth if you would like. Okay, um, and with that being said, we can just go ahead and start with our first case. And so would any of the brave volunteers um, uh, go ahead and read, or if anyone would like to read our first case? I can, I can do it. Um, can you, y'all hear me okay? <laughs> Okay, because I'm outside, so I didn't know if it was too windy. Um, so Maria Rusko is a 48-year-old female teacher presented to the clinic with chest pain angina and mentioned that sometimes she gets, quote, confused. She also has noticed that she does not pee as much. During the appointment, she tells you, quote, doctor, it feels tight here, pointing to her mid-chest area, and I feel so tired. Um, the vitals, height is 5'7", weight is 165 pounds, RR is 25, and notice that her breathing was labor labored, and HR is 140, BP is 88 over 61. Perfect. Thank you so much for reading that. And um, so this is not only for the panelists here, but for those of you who are um, still attendees in the group chat, you can go ahead and type in the chat what you think um, 
stands out to you in this paragraph. And so what we usually do when we have a case like this is we kind of pick apart what we think is important. And from there, we move on and see what can we do about whatever significant thing we found in each, um, in each case. And so, yeah, so people in the chat and if any of the panelists want to like shout something out too, uh, or you could also use the chat, that's fine. Um, one thing that stood out to me is that the patient mentions that she gets confused. So that might be an underlying neurological condition. She also notices that she does not urinate as often. So that could also have something to do with it. Yeah, perfect. Um, so I also, uh, some people in the chat have also touched on that too. And so you're right, like with the confusion, we're kind of thinking, wow, like maybe it is neuro neurological because the brain isn't getting enough um, perfusion to uh, function properly. It could be that. Um, we also said that the patient is not urinating as much. And so that could point at a potential kidney issue, right? Or maybe if there, I know this is like um, kind of a heart related topic, it could also be that there is not enough blood flow to the kidneys. Um, anything else in the group chat? Got it, yeah, so low blood pressure, that is a big one. So we do see that the blood pressure is a little bit on the low side. Um, chest pains, um, that is also kind of what really sticks out. So whenever you see a patient um, presenting to you into a clinic or any, um, setting like that, chest pains are a really big one. So that's kind of the number one thing that you would, um, that would kind of, uh, I would highlight. And so other than that, we can go ahead and look at the vitals, right? So we see that the patient is around 5'7 with a weight of 165 pounds. And so um, if you put that into the BMI calculator, that's around 25.8. And that's slightly on the over, a more overweight side of um, your BMI scale. And RR stands for respiratory rate. So this is um, something that we always measure and that's the breathing rate of a patient. And so uh, 25 is on the high range because the normal respiratory rate for a person is between 12 to 18 um, breaths per minute. And so that also signifies like kind of a hint on this uh, slide that there is uh, that her breathing was labored. Her heart rate um, is 140. So a lot of you mentioned that she um, has a high heart rate and the normal um, heart rate is uh, or anything above 100 is what we would consider tachycardic. And so that means a really fast heart rate. And her blood pressure is a little bit on the lower side. So can anyone uh, tell me what the number, uh, the first number is and what the second number is? Perfect. Systolic and diastolic. So, um, so actually it's, um, it's gonna be diastolic first and then uh, systolic. Um, and so a diastolic is how, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. It is systolic over dis, uh, diastolic. And so systolic is how um, much pressure uh, your heart is beating. And then diastolic is how long um, your, your heart is able to rest. So those are two very important numbers. And the normal systolic rate is between 90 to 120. And the normal diastolic rate is uh, between 60 to 80. So those are kind of the ranges you would be looking for whenever you see um, a blood pressure number. And so given that, what are some tests that you would like to order for this patient? Good, good. So we're seeing, um, I see a lot of EKGs. And so if we can go ahead and go on the next slide. 
Yeah, so an EKG is a really um, big thing that we would want to assess uh, for because the patient does present with chest pains. And so given this EKG, how we would usually approach this would be we would look at the QRS S complex and that shows us like the strength of the um, heart contraction. And it kind of gives us a good idea of how, um, how the heart is working. Like, is it abnormal or is it not abnormal? And so um, we can kind of look here. Um, these really uh, big peaks uh, over here are what are considered a QRS complexes. And we can see that they're different heights. So they look a little funky. So that means that like, you know, maybe there is something going on. And yes, um, Charlie said it, this is abnormal. So that is what we're going for. This EKG looks abnormal. Okay, um, next slide. Um, is there anything else that you all would like to order? Yeah, perfect. So a uh, blood test would also be good too. You can check um, potassium levels, sodium levels, um, stress enzyme levels like troponin, but we're not gonna get into that yet, but those are uh, really good ideas on what we should do. Um, yeah, urine osmolarity test, diuretic, that's also good suggestions too. And there's also another um, thing that we usually test for and um, if you all have heard of ultrasound, it's um, we do one for the heart too, and it's called an echocardiogram, and that's basically an ultrasound of the heart. So that can give us an immediate idea of what the heart is, how the heart looks at right at the moment where um, we're doing the ultrasound for. So can we go ahead and next slide? Yep, Charlie, you got ultrasound. That's right. Um, so this is where we would kind of encourage you all to look up what you think a cardiac tamponade is and, um, and go ahead and either uh, the panelists uh, talk about it or people in the group chat, if you can just go ahead and like do a quick Google search on what you think this is. Um, according to the internet, cardiac tamponade happens when extra fluid builds up in the space around the heart, putting pressure on the heart and preventing it from pumping well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. So that's a, that's a big one. So we see that there's a lot of fluid surrounding the heart, right? And the patient did come in saying that she was tired. And so that's kind of indicative that maybe there wasn't enough blood flow. And so this could be a potential diagnosis as to what this patient may have. So this is where in CBL, we would um, kind of think of ideas on what could be causing uh, these, the patient's symptoms. Uh, and in the group chat, yes, the heart is constricted due to fluid build. Um, around it. So it doesn't have enough space to expand, right? And so because of that, we also notice that the patient is tachycardic, right? So the heart is beating faster. It's because there's not enough blood to per, um, perfuse the entire body. So the heart kind of overcompensates by contracting faster to make sure that you're getting enough oxygen to your tissues. And so right now the fluid is kind of strangling the heart at the moment. So it's not able to function properly. So that's why we see the patient, one, tired, um, hypotensive because it's not working properly, and the heart is beating faster to compensate. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and so we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, so would anyone, we kind of touched on this uh, before, but would someone like to look up what an EKG is? And we can give around like two to three minutes for this learning issue as well.
So according to Google, and as you mentioned earlier, it records the electrical signal from the heart to check for different heart conditions when electrodes are placed on the chest to record those signals. Perfect. So, um, yeah, so like you said, and what a lot of people on the group chat, so an EKG is kind of a snapshot of the heart at the moment. So for for example, like if you take an EKG on a patient, it's important to know that this is what the heart's electrical signal looks like at the moment but it's not necessary like you might be missing some things that have happened previously before the patient take has uh, or took the ekg so that's also something important to know is that this is telling you this is the electrical conduction at the heart of the heart at the moment but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's how the heart is like um throughout the patient's um time with the condition so it might not be able to detect it but it is a good measure and so what the EKG uh, does is that we attach leads to the um, patient's heart. And you know how there's like a lot of them, if you've ever seen a patient, like uh, you can look at the right picture and how the patient just has like a bunch of leads all over um, his chest. They're basically um, looking at the electrical conduction at different planes of the heart. So that's basically taking like many, many pictures of the heart's electrical conduction at that moment. So it's really cool. Um, and on the left side, we can kind of see the heart's electrical signal of when the heart, uh, um, the electrical conduction from when it contracts to when it uh, fills up again. So that's like pretty cool. And this is the, um, the really big mama peak wave is the QRX complex that um, has the strongest electrical um, signal of the heart. And next slide, please. Perfect. And so some of you um, mentioned that ultrasound is also a good um, test to order. And so would anyone like to take a stab on how you would look at this ultrasound? And that's a heart, by the way. <laughs> and it's okay, like just take a stab at what you think is going on here. It's a little hard to tell because um, I'm not too close to it. But yeah, just like Charlie says, it seems like the valves are um, opening and closing oddly. It's kind of hard to see for me though, but that's, I guess, my guess. And, and yeah, the sink is off. It seems like, it seems like it's kind of going all at once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Are there oh, any other, oh, sorry, adding on to oh, that. Oh no, go ahead. It looks like the atria and ventricles, I guess the coordinated rhythm, it doesn't look like it's quite there fully. Yeah. Yeah, those are all um, correct observations that you've made. Would anyone li also like to take a stab at what they see? So we see that they're not in sync. The valves look like fluttering. It looks kind of weird. Um, so kind of a hint, we did say that, oh, if the heart has um, fluid buildup, we do see like this really dark, cave i would describe it that's surrounding the heart and that usually shouldn't look that big so my guess is that there's probably a lot of that looks that is what you see is a lot of fluid surrounding the heart so that um i don't know dr gavon if you can like use a laser pointer pointer to um show the fluid um, I have um, a cursor, but when I put it over, you can't see it. <laughs> oh, it just disappears. Okay. Um, so hopefully you all know what I'm talking about, but I'll try my best to be as descriptive as possible over this webinar. And so that, that like, I guess like um, inverted C, that's the fluid that's getting built up around the heart. The two big holes near the um, bottom left are going to be your atria 
and the two on top of those two holes are going to be your ventricles and we can see that they're not really coordinating i know there's a little bit of a lag but the heart is like contracting like really um very fast and it's kind of shaking too and so these are signs of um of a cardiac uh, tamponade and um that's what an ultrasound of it would look like so you all hit like really really good points of like it's not in sync it's fluttering the valves are weird and it's beating really fast so those are that's basically what an ultrasound of a, of the heart looks like um and in that case are there any other questions in the chat if not we'll move on to our next case and i'll pass that along to maddie All right, hello everyone. So now we're gonna talk about another patient, Joe Smith. Does anyone wanna tell us his story? Joe is a 78 year old male who came into an internal medicine outpatient clinic with chest pain and shortness of breath. He is retired, but he used to own a cigar lounge. When you take a drug history, he mentioned that he used to smoke start at the age of 19 and stopped at the age of 65, smoked two packs a day. He also used to drink alcohol regularly, four to five beers a day, but now he just drinks when he hangs out with his friends or at parties. So you do a physical exam and notice that he has swollen ankles, his abdomen was bloated, and he has a hard time breathing when he was laying down. Perfect. Thanks so much, Sandy. Um, okay, and then um, so you guys kind of know a little bit of his history. Going to his vitals as well, um, this patient is 5'9", 190 pounds. Their heart rate is 112 beats per minute, and their blood pressure is 142 over 93, and their respiratory rate is 18. So either just unmuting or in the chat, do you guys want to mention some of the things that stood out to you either in the vitals, physical exam or the history taking? Awesome, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Hugo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just gonna mention Jasmine in the chat mentioning the edema and potential kidney damage. That's great, um, a great start to the differential diagnosis, right? So in the beginning in these CBLs, we're kind of given very general information. Um, as you guys saw in that last case, when you first got the information, it was like, maybe it's neurological, maybe it's kidneys. Like there's so many different things it can be. Um, so you don't want to just pigeonhole yourself right off the bat and say, oh, well, it's probably a heart problem. I'm not going to consider anything else. Um, so it's really good to kind of consider all the different systems that could be involved. Um, but if you want to continue, sorry. <laughs> Very good. Uh, a lot of I was just gonna say a lot of what's been inside in the chat. So the edema, the the you know the bloating, and then also just the history of of smoking and drinking. I think I would also take into consideration. Awesome. Yeah. So um, he mentioned his smoking history, which is pretty significant, right? Um, so it wasn't you know just a couple of times in college or something. He was smoking two packs a day from the age of nineteen to sixty five. Um, and also drinking four to five beers daily um, for a bit of time as well. Does anyone want to drop in the chat some of the things that can be caused by long-term smoking or drinking? So that can help with our differential as well. And while you guys do that, I'll go through these um, kind of things that you guys have been mentioning. So first, the chest pain, right? We already went through some of the differential diagnosis for chest pain um, and combined with the chest pain, he also has shortness of breath, which those are two kind of like trigger words. If you have a patient, especially coming into the ER, um, you'll definitely want to get that checked out. The heart rate, just like with the last patient, um, is pretty high, right? 112, that would be considered tachycardia. And then again, that history of smoking and alcohol. So I'm already seeing you guys put in, there's like cirrhosis, COPD, um, emphysema, different cancers, right? Liver disease, respiratory issues, um, and just you know, not getting enough oxygen to the right organs, which those are all really important things to consider. Um, like I know Jasmine mentioned, it's the edema, right? So he's bloated in the um, ankles and the abdomen's also bloated. 
And then this one at the very end, so he has a hard time breathing when laying down. Um, does anyone have an idea of what that might be due to? Oh, Hunter, um, so congestive heart failure. Very good, yeah, so that would be something that would sort of give you a hint that the heart is involved, um, specifically heart failure. Um, so this is actually called orthopnea. So it's when the patient lays down, they have a harder time breathing. Um, and I'm thinking way back to one of my first CBLs um, dealing with heart failure is um, they used to talk about the, um, ex like how extreme the heart failure was based on how many pillows the patient needed to use when trying to sleep to prop themselves up um, so that they can breathe better. Um, so basically what that is, is when you lay down, you get more blood return to your heart. But in congestive heart failure, your heart isn't doing a great job at pumping. So it's not able to get that blood back out to the rest of your body. So that can kind of sit around in your lungs and make, the, make it harder for the patient to breathe. Okay, so I think we got through a good amount of those um, in the history. Perfect, yeah, Dr. Gavon, if you wanna to go to the next slide, thank you. So then um, what tests or images would you want to order? And this again, can be pretty broad at this point. EKG, okay, good, yeah. So just like with the last session, um, we're thinking, that the heart is involved. So EKG um, is pretty cheap and quick. Um, it's very accessible. So if you think something could be found on EKG, um, that's a good thing to order. Ultrasound. Yeah, good. Again, um, something, and just a little plug for UCR, UCR teaches us ultrasound. Um, we have an ultrasound curriculum and they say that in the future, it's gonna be like the next, the next stethoscope um, for doctors. So if you have access to an ultrasound and you can just check out their heart really quickly, um, that's also a great idea. And Dr. Gavon, yes, physical exam always um, perfect. So you can listen to those heart sounds and see what those heart sounds are telling us. Very good. Okay, so why don't we go to the next slide and see what we decided to do. Okay, and just as an aside, this isn't like exhaustive. So we just mentioned um, in the CBL a couple of the tests that we thought would be kind of interesting and we can teach you about. Um, so if we didn't talk about your test, um, doesn't mean that we wouldn't actually order it. <laughs> but one, uh, another quick and easy thing to do would be a chest X-ray. So here's an example of our patient's chest X-ray. And here's just a neat little mnemonic you can use that I learned in um, one of my CBLs to help yourself check um, when you're reading a chest X-ray. So the first one is airway. So is the trachea straight? Um, so you can see like straight down the middle of the Perfect. You can see where the cursor is moving. Straight down the middle would be the trachea. So you want to make sure that the trachea is not deviating to one side or the other, because um, that could give you an idea of like if the patient has a pneumothorax or some other issue. But in our case, we have a straight airway. And then borders. So are the heart borders clear? Uh, in this case, I would say they're pretty clear. Um, if you get a lot of fuzziness around the heart, and in the lungs, that could give you an idea of like a pneumonia or something of that sort. C is cardiac. So is there cardiomegaly? And cardiomegaly just means enlarged heart. Um, without even knowing how to judge the size of a heart on a chest x-ray, do you think that this person's heart is a little bit enlarged? Yeah, and I'm already seeing in the chat, it looks pretty big. Um, yeah, so right off the bat, you can see that the heart is larger than you would expect. We typically say that the normal size of the heart should be about half the length of the chest. Um, so in this case, it's like taking up two thirds of that size. And then the, um, yes, they have a big heart, Dr. Gavon, <laughs> extra kind. Um, D would be for diaphragm. 
So again, where that cursor is, you're checking to make sure that those corners where the diaphragm um, meets the, the chest wall there, you wanna make sure that those corners are clear. Um, that would be the first place that any sort of fluid would build up. Um, so again, if you're having some sort of pneumonia um, or fluid buildup, it would start first in those corners. And then E would be edges. So you, this is a little harder to see even in um, our lectures for radiology. I was like, um, I'm not sure if I'm looking in the right spot, um, but you wanna make sure that the lungs are extending all the way to the edge there where you can kind of see the, the ribs on the sides. It would be um, like a total collapse, a tel collapsed lung, you'd be able to see pretty well. Um, so if there was like a big black area um, on one of the sides, then again, you would be thinking like a pneumothorax or something like that. Okay, so um, if we're thinking back to our differential diagnosis, we're kind of leaning a little more heavily on the heart, right? Or like heart failure or something like that. So then for whoever said ultrasound, we also got an ultrasound. And just to help with a little bit of reference, a normal heart is shown for you on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side is what our patient's heart looks like. Um, so just by taking a look at that, any ideas of an abnormality in our patient? Good, so we have someone saying enlarged left ventricle. Um, do others agree? Awesome, Sandy agrees. Okay, I do wanna address the, um, so just for ultrasound, someone said more muscular. Um, so it is an important distinction between if there's more muscle in the left ventricle or if the left ventricle is larger, meaning there would actually be less muscle. Um, so for ultrasound, the muscle would actually be this kind of lighter white portion. So if our left ventricle was more muscular, you'd see a lot more white around the left ventricle. Uh, but in this case, um, fluid shows up as um, anechoic or darker on ultrasound. So you can see that there's like a, a larger space for blood to fill in the left ventricle. It's more anechoic or dark. Perfect. Um, so that's an, an important distinction because there's two different um, types of heart failure. So you can have hypertrophy or just more muscle in the left ventricle, which would help your heart beat, pump more blood to the rest of the body, right? It's more muscular. It can send out more blood at each pump. Um, but the downside of that is that now you're kind of taking up that space on the inside. So the heart can pump more blood, but it can't fill up as well, okay? On the opposite end, like what we're seeing here, exactly cardiac remodeling. Um, on the other hand, for our patient, we're opening up more space so that when the heart's relaxing, it can get more blood in, but it's gonna be weaker at pumping, right? So it's the difference between diastolic and systolic heart failure, okay? Um, perfect. So are we having an enlarged, more muscular left ventricle, or is there more volume for blood? More volume for blood. More volume. Exactly. Perfect. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but if anyone wants to put it together for us, what cardiac related disease do you think this person has? Perfect. Heart failure, yeah. So we're having heart failure with um, systolic dysfunction, right? So this person's going to um, be able to fill up with a little bit more blood, but won't be able to pump as much. And then we'll talk a little bit about treatment on the next slide because we're coming up on our learning issue. So if everyone wants to just take a few minutes and Google what heart failure is, kind of how it works, and then some potential treatments for this patient of ours.
And I know there's a lot of options, but you can just pick a couple. Anyone see anything about ACE inhibitors? Perfect. Yeah, so someone says um, you can give the patient ACE inhibitors to help lower their blood pressure, right? So um, with heart failure, the big thing is that the heart is having a hard time pumping enough blood to the whole body. Right. So if you perfect and beta blockers. So if you lower their blood pressure, that heart's going to have to pump against less pressure. Right. So it's a little bit easier for that heart to get the blood out to the rest of the body. Um, so that can relieve some of the symptoms. And then beta blockers. Very good. So, again, you're kind of slowing that heart rate, reducing the blood pressure, um, helping the heart just function a little bit better. Exactly. And I love you guys are bringing in some of the social things, right? So we want to make sure um, that this person considers cutting back on their drinking, hopefully even stopping the drinking. Um, you know, they worked at a cigarette lounge for a long time. Um, maybe they still smoke or don't, but they hang out with friends that still do. So we want to have that conversation with them um, to make sure that they um, are living a healthier life to make sure that their heart um, stays strong for longer. And yeah, reducing salt, right? So all the things that are going to help bring down blood pressure um, are going to be a good option for this patient. And I think someone mentioned exercise. Yeah, I would say um, exercise is almost always a safe bet as something that you can um, tell your patient to engage in. Um, of course, you know, the right intensity. Um, okay, since we have 10 minutes, I think that's probably good. I'll just mention um, some, someone talked about a very specific diuretic. So diuretics um, will help the patient kind of urinate some of that extra fluid to relieve the edema, help them with breathing a little bit easier. And then I think just in the interest of time, we can move on to the question portion. We wanted to leave a few minutes for you guys, um, either through chat or um, panelists, if you wanna unmute, you can just ask us whatever questions you might have about med school or UCR in particular. So I had a question. I know you mentioned ultrasound and how that can be a really vital tool in the future. So I was wondering how, how is that integrated in the curriculum? Is it, is it coming in at a certain time, like third year, second year, anything like that? Or is it kind of throughout that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one really great thing about UCR is they really get us started with clinical things right off the bat. Um, so our ultrasound curriculum started, I think, block two, because that's when we started learning about heart and lungs. Um, so as we're learning about the heart, they have um, an ultrasound session so that we're learning about the heart in the classroom and in clinical skills. Um, and then we do ultrasound where we also are scanning hearts um, for ultrasound. Um, so it's really integrative. Um, we have, I think, a couple sessions per block, um, and the whole first year, you're just kind of learning how to use the ultrasound, and then your second year, you can become an instructor, so you learn even more, and then you teach the first years how to use ultrasound, um, and then we just started a selective as well. So in third and fourth year, you can um, use ultrasound in the clinics when you're seeing patients. So it's, it's a really great program. Awesome, thank you. Okay, Justin, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, 
Um, thank you for taking the time to do this. Uh, I just want to ask to y'all are both specifically MS1s. You said, yeah, I was just going to ask, how is UCR prepping you for, for boards? Are the, are the classes kind of catered toward helping you learn for boards? Or yeah, what is the, the classroom kind of like? Or I guess, what are the, some of the things that you're learning? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that second year is much more specific towards boards because that's when you know you're going to be taking step one um but all of our lecturers mention step one <laughs> when they go through um they do a really great job of mentioning high yield things so we'll have lecturers who just say oh this is something that comes up on step one a lot and even if you're not really thinking of step one per se it just gets you prepared for um, the kind of things that you should focus on or maybe um, you know, make sure you know that first round. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that they do also is in second year, they have step one coaches. Okay. So um, I, I think there's a lot of resources for you going into the second year. Um, but yeah, I feel like they're, they're really cognizant of it. But first year, personally, I'm just focusing a lot more on the classes and making sure that I lay that good foundation um, moving forward, you know, talking about pathology. Okay. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to what Maddie said, um, aside from helping us prep with boards our second year, mm -hmm. um, something that I really do appreciate at UCR is how supportive our um, academic um, advisors are because they do help set us up with one-to-one um, -one tutoring with okay. a second year who mm -hmm. can help us go through the material and what like we need to really focus on each yeah. um, block. And we also have like group tutoring as well. And so there's always like someone there to help you um, throughout your medical school journey, especially when you first walk in. So I think that really helps with the transition um, going in from not being in school to being right. in school. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, guys. And then Sandy, if you want to ask your question. Yes, thank you guys so much for putting this on. I was going to ask for Dr. Gavon if there is a trend you've noticed where for some topics or areas of the body that students tend to struggle with for CBLs, and then for Carolyn and Maddie, if you guys have noticed, um, any ones that you've struggled with and how you've been able to work on improving for future um, CBLs? Okay, so your question was specifically if what if what are tend to be the maybe organ systems that students struggle with the most? Is that what you're saying? Um, um, so we, we don't really, I think it's not as well identified in CBLs because CBL is just like a really nice wrap up of the week. Um, so throughout the week, you would have had your didactic like lectures and um, all of that, which is, you know, some of it's pretty heavy, um, like molecular based things that you're doing, um, depending on, you know, the learner level. Um, and then you have your clinical skills where you learn that, then you have your doctoring sessions where you learn the interviewing. And so really Friday doing this case, you kind of have a nice like wrap up of everything you've done that week. Um, so I think what is nice that CBL can highlight, and this is just for everyone, is these learning issues. Um, one thing we kind of failed to tell you at the beginning was these learning issues. There's about three or four that are core, which means every single group, every small group of CBL, which there's about 10 groups in year one, nine groups in year two, every small group has um, three to four learning issues that everyone does the same, right? And this is chosen by myself and faculty. We have concepts and topics that we think everybody needs to master. And then the rest of the learning issues, which ends up being another four to five to six, depending on how many students are in your uh, group, are made up by you. So if you are sitting with your group and you've just done this one and you really were like, you know, I really, it's so interesting to learn about cardiac tamponade, but I really don't understand the, the, like the mechanism. How is it really causing the heart to beat faster when it's restricting, right? So you can bring that up to the group as like, hey, you know, I'd like to do my learning issue on looking at the physiology behind that because I still want to understand it more. So you can kind of um, 
cater and make learning issues. Every group makes their own learning issues past the core ones. And this is going to help those areas that you may feel, feel you're weaker in, right? So it kind of highlights that week, okay, I'm a little less on the biochem or I'm a little less on pharmacology this week. So you may add some learning issues where it helps the whole group, right? Because even if it's your learning issue, you come back the following week and teach it to the rest of your group. Thank you. You're welcome. And then your question for us was, um, if we specifically struggled for, with any organ systems and what we did. I think um, not specific to CBL, but coming in as an MS1 when we started, um, the organ systems, just all of them, heart, lungs, and kidney was the first one we did. And it was like so much work. And um, I, so I just struggled with like the amount of information and how to integrate everything. So I reached out to the academic office and I got set up with a tutor and my tutor was amazing. The MS2s are so great. Um, she sat down with me and just kind of asked me like how I was studying. And she gave me like all of her tips to sort of like cut out the dead weight, you know, of like hours I was spending that just um, weren't particularly effective. So I just sort of changed my study habits a little bit and tried to study a little bit more actively. And it was super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and I to add on to what Maddie said, I think for me, one of the hardest blocks would have to uh, deal with the GI uh, system. So the gastrointestinal system, because for me, it was very difficult to kind of separate all of the different hormones and just all of the different organs that are in that system. And so like Maddie, I also went to the academic office and they set me up with a tutor it was really nice to just kind of work out what works best for you because just because some of your classmates are doing one thing, it really doesn't mean that you have to follow their learning style. Just do whatever works best for you and, and don't feel bad that you're behind or something like that because those feelings are universal among your classmates and just really just figure out what works best for you and go with that. And it's constantly changing too. Thank you so much. We're just about at our time. I wanted to ask if uh, there's, you've been answering the questions in the q and I wanted to make sure that there was, uh, it, or that everyone had a chance to look at those and see if anybody wanted to make any uh, comments on those verbally real quick. Sure, yes, actually, I think I saw Maddie, you were answering number one and I was trying to answer number two, but we might just do that verbally quicker. So thank you for that. Heads up. Um, so one question we got is, uh, what is your learning style? And do you think UCR's teaching style fits how you prefer to learn? I think this is a very, uh, this is a question everyone's going to answer very differently. Um, but I do think that um, one thing I can say specifically for our program is uh, we don't lean towards a certain learning style. Um, there's lots of literature out there that's actually debunking learning style. <laughs> so take a look at that. Um, but uh, what I will say is it's actually depends on what it is, right? Because learning is a process. Um, and one quote that I really like from our director of um, faculty development, and she says is, if learning isn't hurt, right? If it's, if you're not putting in the effort, if it's not effortful, if you're not like really struggling, then you're probably not really learning, right? So, um, I think that there's different um, modalities that we use for different things. Obviously, um, there's uh, things that work much better hands-on, which is why we have a lot of hands-on type things. There's other things that work better in podcasts and videos, right? If I send you a seven minute video on acid base, or if I sit in front and lecture for 50 minutes, I'm pretty sure you're gonna get everything from that seven minute video. Um, so I think we have a really good um, array of different things that we put into the mix. Um, and we, we really do try to give you different things to help you. Um, and I think if Maddie and, and Carolyn, you want to add to that, but I think you've already mentioned that we have a great support team that if you're struggling with something in the way that it's being um, taught or just being presented, uh, we have a great uh, staff and faculty that will help you figure out what is the best way for you to absorb the information. Yeah, I completely agree with everything Dr. Gavon said. And quickly, I would just add on that 
um, our students are really nice and collaborative um, within our own cohort and also our second years. Are, I just love them so much. Um, but if you send in the group chat that you're struggling with a certain concept, you'll immediately get people sending you YouTube videos or like names of YouTube channels um, that help them. So and not only the academic office, but if you just talk to people in your class, you'll get a ton of resources um, for you know whatever, whatever type of learning that you like to do. All right, with that, we're gonna have to end it there because we've got another session starting in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Gavon and first year medical students, Maddie Andrade and Carolyn Vo. Please give them a big virtual round of applause. And also a huge thank you to our brave volunteers who had no idea they were gonna be asked to do this. You all can now put on your resume that you participated in a CBL. So when you go and apply for medical school, you're like, yeah, I've done that. It's not a big deal. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all very much. Our Pathway Programs presentation will be beginning in, in just a few minutes uh, on the next, uh, in, in the next room. So we invite you to join us for that. Also, for those of you who are interested, the Prime Information Session is scheduled for tomorrow, Friday at 4 p.m. And if you'd like to go back and watch our sessions from Thursday, and, or excuse me, from Tuesday and Wednesday, those are also available uh, as recordings on our website right now. So thank you all very much. If you're leaving us, have a great evening. If you're coming with us, uh, and we'll see you in just a couple of minutes in the Pathway Programs Room. Thank you, everybody.